must realize that no great university, no great hospital has ever taken a product and put it up to the market. And these men not only um, put it on the market, but they developed these products that have helped hundreds of millions of people. So we have to be very careful about, uh, about our criticisms of industry because you can't find four people on earth who've helped the humankind more in the 20th century. And they all worked for industry. This was for Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, this was for ICI Industries in London. And this was for Daiichi Sankyo Company in Tokyo. Preventive cardiology. Um, Dr. Paul Dudley White uh, is considered to be the father of American cardiology. He brought the first ECG machine over. He trained in London with Sir Thomas Lewis. And um, in 1938, in the second edition of his great textbook of cardiology, he wrote about preventing heart disease. Now, uh, that was, nobody had ever heard about that. Cardiologists were supposed to diagnose and treat uh, very fatal and serious illnesses. And he had the idea of preventing it. Now, he was, a, he was um, President Eisenhower's doctor when Eisenhower had a heart attack. And um, he uh, used the prestige of his office uh, to, um, to uh, get Eisenhower to provide money for the National Heart Institute, part of the NIH. It's now the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And, um, and he pushed for the development of the field of chronic epidemiology. And they took a town very close to where we live, just west of Boston, Framingham, and they took the population of Framingham and enrolled them. And they have been going for half a century, making enormous contributions to prevention. And Dr. Cannell, um, who is uh, living and well, uh, in 1961 published the first paper in this field. And one of the things about that paper that is so remarkable looking back a half century is that the term coronary risk factors, which everyone knows was introduced by Cannell, but through the genius of Paul Dudley White. Echocardiography. And for echocardiography, I really mean non-invasive imaging. So there's echocardiography, but you could also put down PET scans, MRI, CT scans. And there are two um, Swedish um, professors, very interesting. They worked in different fields in the same university. Um, Inge Edler, who was a senior cardiologist in Stockholm and appropriately named Helmut Hertz, who was a physicist. And uh, coming off World War II, they were aware of ultrasound because of the, um, uh, you know, uh, the detection of submarines and also the detection of torpedoes. And they said, well, if you can do that, why can't you detect moving objects within the heart? And obviously, the heart is constantly moving. So this is how echocardiography was born. And finally, I come back to the electricity and uh, show you pacemakers and ICDs, Paul Zoll. In 1952, a professor at Harvard, uh, Michelle Mirovsky, also working in his, um, in actually not a, he didn't even have a garage, he had a basement. <laughs> so Paul Zoll developed the first pacemaker. At the time, it was as big as that ECG machine I showed you on the first slide. And now, of course, it's the size of a, uh, Kennedy silver dollar. And uh, Michelle Morovsky, an Israeli whose professor died of sudden cardiac death while he was making rounds with him in Tel Aviv. And he felt that he should be able to do something about that because you could shock the heart from the outside. Why can't you shock it from the inside? 
but he couldn't get anywhere in Israel. He emigrated to Baltimore, worked um, at uh, Johns Hopkins, but mostly worked alone and developed the implanted cardioverita defibrillator. And now this is implanted into um, about a half a million subjects worldwide every year. Okay, so we have all of these uh, great developments, and if you uh, want, we could go on and talk about the next 10, which would also be great. But what is the impact? Claude Lanfant was director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. He gave a lecture and, uh, and showed this slide of the change in the U.S. life expectancy from 1970 to 2000. The bottom line was there was a six-year increase over 30 years. Pretty good. That meant one year uh, every five years. And four years out of these six years were to, due to the conduct, reduction of cardiovascular disease. That's taking all of these incredible developments and putting them together with others. And you see, there's nothing, uh, so cardiovascular disease, four years, perinatal disease, eight months, injuries, cancer, cancer, two months over 30 years. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease actually got worse, HIV infection and other causes. So this has been a success story, no matter how you want to dress it up, no matter how you criticize it, this is the bottom line helping people live more complete lives and live longer. So what are the major lessons? These great advances, with the exception of the coronary angiogram, were dependent on decades of research by basic scientists and engineers. And it is on the shoulders of these that these clinicians because what I've shown you are pictures of clinicians made these great discoveries. Interdisciplinary and academic industrial collaborations. We can't work in a silo. Silo is cardiology, and that's all. Most of these advances you know, came from engineering, actually. They didn't come from cardiology. It was cardiologists who cashed in on it, so to speak. So interdisciplinary, certainly. You see that in Grunzig. Cardiology, vascular disease, and radiology came together in this young man and, uh, and changed the field. And again, academic industrial collaborations to which I've already referred. International efforts. The pictures of the people I showed you came from three continents and 11 nations. So uh, 